All right, everyone. Welcome, and thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Uh, my name is Keith Spencer, and I'm one of our career experts here at FlexJobs. And FlexJobs, for those of you who don't know, has been the most trusted and leading site for remote job listings since 2007. And we are thrilled to have as our guest today, Stan Miller from StoryKate to discuss mastering your response to tell me about yourself. Stan is a trainer and a storyteller who has been helping transform the way professionals narrate their journey for years. And we are very excited to have him with us today. Before we dive into Stan's presentation, I do wanna cover a few housekeeping items. This will be a 60 minute webinar that includes a presentation with Stan followed by our audience Q&A. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be emailed out to you all later this week. If you would like to ask a question for our Q&A, please put it in the Q&A section rather than the chat section. Uh, we likely won't be able to get to every question, but we can almost guarantee that you will learn something helpful. With all that said, I would like to now turn things over to Stan. Welcome, Stan. Hey, thank you so much, Keith. And welcome everyone to the a masterclass on storytelling. Tell me about yourself. Uh, I am super pumped, excited to be here with you. I have been looking forward to this session all weeks, all week long. It's 2 p.m. here where I am in Orlando, Florida. Um, and again, I've got a lot to cover today, so we're going to jump right into it. But before I do that, I really want to thank Keith, Katie, and the entire FlexJob team for making this possible not only for me, but for you, they're doing a great special work and you should be paying attention to what they're doing for job seekers and in the job market, they're doing great things. So thank you all for allowing me to be here and giving me this platform. Now I've made a lot of promises to each of you to wow you today. Um, so I've got to jump right into it. We've only got an hour and today it is my hope that you will walk away with a fresh perspective and actionable ways to improve how you answer the dreaded at times question, tell me about yourself in interviews. And so for those of you that are in the room and you like uh, agendas, I'm an agenda person. I'm going to first start by covering some big marker tips, um, how to communicate with me, because this is a two-way street here. I know I'm presenting, but I want to make sure that you know that I care about you. I care about your questions. And I, I care about um, what you have to say on this topic. So I'm going to ask you a few questions and we'll get to talk during this during this session. We'll, we'll cover why storytelling is important and how stories work. Then I will introduce to you a framework that you can use to answer the question, tell me about you. Again, it's framed up in multiple different ways. Tell me about you. Tell me about yourself. But we'll talk about those nuances. And most importantly, I'm not going to just tell you how it works. I'm going to show you how it works. Um, so you'll get to see a demonstration of how this all looks when you're presenting yourself in interviews. So I'm really excited to share that with you. And plus, if you stick around till the end, I have a massive opportunity that could change your career forever um, near the end of the event. So I want to offer you something and, and surprise you. And then we'll drop, we'll jump into a Q&A and Keith will come back on. So let's get into it. Um, during this presentation, we're going to we're using a platform called Big Marker. You all are in here with me, and um, we'll be using the Q and A and chat feature. So here's the important thing: if you have a question and you ask the question in the chat, it will likely get lost. But if you have a question and you want to get that question answered, use the Q and A feature because Keith will be monitoring those for us to make sure that we are able to answer as many of those as possible. OK, the chat feature is for us to talk back and forth. And as I'm looking at it, I mean, it's running wild. So there are about a thousand of you in this room. Um, so let's start by dropping where you are dialing in from in the chat. Um, and so just right now, show me um, that you're that you're here. And I would say drop where you are um, are from in the chat. Yes. OK, so Chicago, Austin, let's see, Georgia. I mean, it's going so fast. Houston, Paris, you're from all over the world. Thank you so much for being here. I see New York. I see Brooklyn. Okay. I see Boulder, Colorado, Kenya. Thank you all for being here. And so it's important that we just kind of say hello. And this is my way of saying hello to you. So I talked about the promises that I'm going to make to you today. And I've made a few. If you've, if you looked at the description, you see some promises there. And so, um, 
here are my promises. Number one, you're, you're going to gain the clarity you need today when answering the question, tell me about you in interviews. Number two, you will learn a storytelling framework to prepare you for interviews. And number three, um, I'm going to teach you how to build deep human connections with interviewers that lead to offers. Okay. So my goal is to get you prepped and ready to really make your mark when asked the, when asked the question, tell me about you. And most of us are preparing based on what we believe works or what we've been told works. And, and that shapes the way that we are, we prepare. And so we, we operate on what we think works and what we believe works and what we've been told works. And so we're going to share a, a bit about building a belief system today too. Now, when I'm speaking with candidates, executives, especially mid-career professionals, most have embraced one of these preparation models, which I call the preparation trifecta. Now today, it's possible that you are here right now and you're part, you're, you're part of one or more of the trifecta. So let's explore a couple of archetypes that, that I typically see. First, there's the researcher. Now this is, we're talking about when you're preparing for an interview, right? Uh, if you're a researcher, you believe that knowledge is power, that every piece of information matters. You probably spend hours on the job description, company website, aligning your skills to the jobs. And you tend to leave no stone unturned when it comes to information. Now, one thing that most researchers care deeply about is um, letting others know that you've done your homework, showing up and letting people know that you've done your homework. So there's the researcher. Then we move right along to the rehearser. Now, precision and practice are your mantras if you are a rehearser. Every word matters. You've played out the interview questions and the scenarios, and you've practiced how you answer those questions. And your goal as a rehearser is to have a solid response to every question in all scenarios. Now, practicing makes you feel less nervous, so you tend to go all in on interview preparation as a rehearser. Now, and finally, we have the beloved renegades among us. You believe the power of genuine, unscripted responses. You think, I've got this, and believe that you can handle any curveball they throw your way. Generally, you probably think that you can simply show up and sell your way into the role. Now, as you look at these three models, I want you to take a moment to reflect. Uh, I'll place no judgment, by the way, on your response. Which one of the trifecta resonates closest with you? It's important to know that these aren't flaws, right? But it's important for us to understand how we prepare. So let's just drop that in the chat. And so I can, I can hear from you a bit. Okay, a lot of ones, some threes. I've got some ones and twos. The researcher, I keep, I see one, I see, I see a bunch of ones, researchers, and I see a bunch of twos. Occasionally I'm seeing a three here. And so, so that's great. And it's just important to know how you think about an interview and prepping for an interview and what state you may be entering this process in. So I'm guessing you're here for one of the, the following reasons. And, and there may be many reasons you're here in this room, but you may have been told you should sell yourself in interviews. Um, but you've been looking for someone to show you how to do that. And you're not sure uh, what to believe. Maybe you have doubts uh, on what works. Um, you might be looking for a position, for a new position or now facing a pivot. You may be out of work, looking to get back into the workforce. Um, some of you feel today maybe like you're not ready um, for interviews, and but you can't afford to lose them if you get opportunities. I'm going to say that one more time. Some of you in this room feel like maybe you're not ready, but you can't afford to lose the opportunity when you get a chance to perform in an interview. Maybe you feel alone. Job search can be one of the most loneliest places. I know this. I'm working with lots of job seekers, and it's easy to lose your identity when things change after so many years. And some of you may be in this room and you've had a, a job for many, many years, and now you've found yourself back on the market. And after so many years, you've had this identity of working with this company in this title and this position, and now you've got to go find something new. And that isn't easy to do. 
And some of you have never met me before. In fact, most of you haven't. And maybe you you see me on LinkedIn, but you haven't met me. So I'll share two minutes about me. I'm I'm I live in Orlando. I'm a girl dad. Um, I have a, a beautiful wife, Kyla, I've been married to for over 20 years. I have a junior in high school named Naya, who's 16, and my daughter Gabriella lives in Austin, works for Netflix as a project manager, and she is 27 years old. And my career trajectory has been, I left AT&T as a mid manager. After that, spending 12 years at AT&T, I joined a tech, a tech startup. And three years later, I was a C-level executive at that tech startup. And I just got to a point in my career where um, I really wanted to teach people storytelling. I had used storytelling for most of my career. And um, I had reached the pinnacle of my career as a C-level startup executive, and, and we had gotten to a level of profitability, which was great. Um, but I decided to leave all that behind and start a storytelling business about two and a half years ago. And I just love helping people recognize their potential so they can achieve greatness in life. And I do that by teaching them storytelling. So that's just a bit about me. Um, the truth is that I have something special for you today, and it's important that you lock in with me. And so now isn't the time to multitask. Uh, so if you're multitasking, I'm just going to invite you to turn off all your distractions. Just turn them off. It's okay. I've turned mine off. Feel free to turn yours off. And I'm giving you permission to do that. I know it's easier said than done, but I'm inviting you to into an experience today. And if you're distracted, you'll miss the gift. And so for the next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to share exactly what you need to change the way you tackle Tell Me About You. Before we start, again, at the end of the presentation, I've got something special for you, so, so hang with us. All right, so I've made some promises. Before I teach you something, I'm going to ground you on some truths, some things that you need to know. I want you to take notes. So if you have a, a writing instrument or however you take notes, and there's a specific reason that I want you to take these notes that I'll reveal to you later. So let's talk about truths. When interviewing... Okay, the first truth I want to share with you, it's not what you, they think about you, it's how they feel about you. The number one criteria for selection is trust over skills. Let's say it one more time. The number one criteria in interviews for selection is trust and not skills. And there's no better way to build trust um, than to tell stories that involves building an emotional connection with people. Okay, so that's truth number one. Truth number two, remember the, the they, the interviewers, are moving forward based on who they believe you are from the information they have read. So when you get into that interview, they have already made a decision to say yes. And here's what I mean. If you've been invited to an interview, they've looked through maybe hundreds of candidates. You have stood out on paper enough your Brand has stood out enough for them to say yes. They show up to the interview with a yes. And so now your job is to show up and support that decision. Okay? You have to show up to interviews and actually support that decision. On to number three. Now, number three is no skill set, qualification, or achievement outweighs human connection. So when all things are equal, it's who they feel most connected with that gets the offer. It's worth repeating. When all things are equal, that means we all have a very similar resume. We all have a college degree. We all have backgrounds. We all have certificates. It's who they feel most connected with that will get the offer. But here's the interview timeline, okay? Okay. And this is based on a 60 minute interview. And some of you in this audience have 30 minute interviews, 45 minutes, maybe even 15. But I, I like to use 60 minutes because if you're in an interview process, there's a high likelihood that you will get to a 60 minute interview. And your goal in a 60 minute inter interview should be to reveal information and experience over time. Okay. Reveal information and experience over time. But here's what can happen. We seek to pack all the energy, all of our background at the front end of the interview in the story in the first few minutes. And that typically starts with answering this question that we struggle with, which is tell me about you. So 
we want to give them as much information at the front end, but we don't quite realize that we have lots of times to sort of leak this information out if we really look at the interview a bit more strategically. Now, many of us, when we're preparing for to answer the question, tell me about you, we're seeking to impress them and not necessarily to inform or provide them with an experience. So you may end up going with a highlight reel, right? And many of us know, you know, the peak stories, the highlight reel, the chronological history of where we've been or more of a resume regurgitation. Now, what, what many of us are failing to realize is that you have an entire hour to get that story out. Now, in terms of storytelling, imagine um, Luke meeting Yoga, Yoda. So you've got Luke and Yoda completing the Jedi training, finding out Darth Vader was his father, overcoming that, and destroying the Death Star in five minutes. That's what it feels like to an interviewer when you are packing everything in every single thing into the first five to seven minutes in the interview. Now, if this resonates with you and you understand that, that may, and maybe you are packing a lot of this information into the beginning of the interview, just drop a yes in the chat. Just if, um, <laughs> thanks, David, I see you. I like star Wars too. So again, you know, we're just using, we're just using references. Um, you know, I'm not a movie aficionado. So again, yeah, this, this makes sense to most of you. I see you in the chat. It does. And why it resonates is because most of us try to get everything out in that first few minutes. And the result of that is confusion. And if you confuse in an interview, you lose. If you confuse in an interview, you lose. So I've spent... I spent lots of time unpacking the answer to tell me about you with hundreds of people, with hundreds of clients um, across many years. And most people feel the same way and most stories sound very similar. Now, this is not a typical pattern that I'm going to share with you, but I want you to look at this pattern and I want you to, as you examine what I have seen in many, many people's lives when unpacking the story of tell me about you, this is what it feels like to your audience at times, all right? So most people feel like this when not only telling their story, but this is how it feels to the audience. Now, I want you to look at this. I want you to evaluate it, and I want you to engage me in the chat. Is this you? Has this been someone you know? Have you felt like this, right? As you kind of look at this, yeah, of course. It's some of us are having that painful moment right now. And so if this is you, uh, you know, feel free to type in me. I mean, I've done it before. We're all guilty of this. Um, this isn't storytelling. This is not storytelling. But let me let me tell you what is storytelling. So if I ask many of you today, what is a story? Um, I'm betting most of you might say. Is telling people what happened so that they gain an understanding. And the truth is, that's not wrong. Um, and it does support our desire to deliver chronological events because we want to lay out things that happen in a chronological order. But there is a different way to think about stories and interviews. And one of the very, very best definitions that I can think of in terms of story um, I picked up on by a storyteller named Dennis Ross on LinkedIn. It was on a live session. And what Dennis points out is it's not telling others what happened. It's telling others what happened because of what happened. I'll say it again. It's not telling others what others, what happened. It's telling others what happened because of what happened, revealing the deeper meaning. So I've put together today for us to kind of warm up. Um, some storytelling to uh, some some to do's and some things that we shouldn't do as we think about sort of our guiding principles to storytelling and how it all should work. So when we're talking about tell me about you, what you should do or what you should not do is start with information. 
you should start with meaning. You should not sequence information in chronological order, but you should sequence information in the order that matters. So the highest priority of information should trump chronological order. Now, you shouldn't share your story from event to event. I know that we think it's easy to say, I went from this title to this title. We should share a story from effect to effect, meaning what happened here versus what happened here, and why did I make a decision to move? People want to understand the why behind these moments. Now, the other thing is, is don't overshare, which many of us do, and drown them in the details, but do share the most relevant moments. And what I'm here to share with you about story is the most important thing to remember is that great stories are deceptively simple in structure. And it's the sequence of the information in storytelling that simply matters most. So here's a modified story arc that I use to help people answer the the tell me about yourself question in interviews. So story is a transformation. Most of you know this, that no storytelling over time. It's a transformation over time. It starts with a beginning, a middle, and ends in a resolution. Now, before I unpack the, the, the tell me about you version of the story arc, you must know that there are different patterns for different stories. So I'm a storyteller and I teach storytelling, and this pattern is one of the many patterns that I use, but this pattern is exclusively for tell me about you in interviews. For example, this isn't the pattern that I use for answering behavioral questions. It's exclusively designed for tell me about you. All right, so let's get started. We start the story with an introduction, right? And you reveal the first chapter followed by a defining moment and a resolution that led to chapter two. Okay. So we've got a chapter, we introduce a chapter to your story, and then we move to a defining moment and a resolution. Then we do chapter two, which is more of the same. We have chapter two introduced and we break your career into chapters and chapter two is introduced and we have defining moments and resolutions. We also have motivations that we'll share. Chapter three reveals more of where you are today. It's not the end of your story. It's simply where you are today. Think of it as a revealing of the desired state and where you want to be next. So when you're talking about your career in chapters and you break down chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and we're telling that in a story, the structure is actually simple but the end of that story is actually where you want to be next. So the structure's simple, beginning of your experience, middle and now, but it's not easy. So simple things sometimes aren't easy. So you don't naturally think about your career in chapters, I know this. In order to do this, you should bucket your experiences into chapters for you to do this work. Now, some of you have changed roles, have gained new responsibilities in your career. You've worked on various projects. What I'm asking you to think about here is to group these things into three groups. And it's okay if your chapters are in chronological order. I hear you um, calling for some examples in the chat and we are getting there, all right? So here's where, here. this is a, a simple way to think about this. Just start with your resume. Ask yourself a few questions as you evaluate your experiences. What drives you to do the things you do best? What leads to change and and what has led to the change and the moves that you've made? Are there clear chapters, disciplines, or roles or pivots in your background? And what happened before the final job listed on your resume? Okay, so so what's happening inside of these moments? You want to surface context to these moves that you made. Now, as we unpack this further, when you're brainstorming and when you're done brainstorming, looking through your resume and you're clustering and circling your chapters, you'll want to frame up the intro. 
And the intro are what I call the ingredients um, that there are a certain amount of ingredients that make a great introduction. All right. So as we're introing our answer to tell me about you, we have to communicate that effectively. So an effective intro to a tell me about you story communicated well starts with um, your overarching career theme. What is the name of your career theme? Right. My story is a story of reinvention. And I know this sounds crazy, but you should name your career story. Is it pivot? Is it reinvention? Is it technology? What is it? You should have a name to it. All right. Then there, the, there are each number, one, two, three for the chapters. And so you'll want the number and names of those chapters. So my first chapter is AT&T, right? Because I spent 12 years of my career at AT&T. But go with three chapters, okay? The connection and a connection from the intro to chapter one, you're, you're going to see how I frame this up that builds a connection between the intro that you have directly into chapter one. Now, we're also going to set expectations for the journey ahead for our audience. So we need to build a connection between the intro and chapter one. We need to set expe expectations for our audience. And again, having the names of the chapters, that's where it all starts. Now, many of you, I'm guessing, on this uh, on this call and in, in this webinar um, are, are thinking, well, Stan, that's great, but I need to see you do it. I need, to, I need you to show me how it works. Um, so... If you're interested in a demo of this and what it might sound like, just drop a yes in the in the chat. I mean, is, are you are you with me? Do you want to hear what this sounds like? Yeah. Like I told you at the beginning, I promised you you were going to get the real information, the real experience today, right? So I want to share it with you. And um, again, you can look at this, and this is a framework. Okay. So. It sounds something like this. I like to think of my my career as a blank story having three chapters. I call chapter one my blank. Okay, so I call chapter one my AT&T story where I spent years, 12 years working with AT&T. In chapter two, I call my technology startup years. And in chapter three, which is where I'm now, I call my entrepreneurial experiences. Okay, so what I'm doing with my audience, okay, is I am setting up the stage for what's coming. I'm not giving them all of my background I'm just giving them the intro. And again, what you're seeing on your screen, and, and feel free to take a snapshot of this, what you're seeing on the screen is a framework. You can be flexible inside this framework. And it it sounds simple, but I'd love to kind of give you a demo of like what I might say because I'm kind of piecing it together for you. So, um, so what I might say, if I'm teeing up my own, tell me about you and I'm trying to build my intro is I like to think of my career as a reinvention story with three chapters. I call chapter one, my exploration years where I spent 12 years with AT&T in seven different roles. Chapter two was my pivot from corporate to startup. And chapter three, where I am today as an entrepreneur is where I teach people the art and science of storytelling. So that that's just me kind of giving you a an idea of what a good, effective intro sounds like. All right, so I want you to just give me some feedback on that. This, are, are you tracking with me? Just type yes in if you're tracking with me. All right, so that I'm giving you the frame, but I'm not. I'm not giving you the answers to the test. I'm just giving you the frame in this call, okay? And I'm going to give you some demos and some examples of what it might sound like if you execute on this well. Now we'll move to the chapters. So if we've got a frame for the intro, we have to really talk about what do we say inside of each chapter? Because 
as you as you just heard, I just introduced three chapters, but now I'm going to go back to chapter one and I'm going to cover some information in chapter one. Now, what I'm not going to do is talk about all the great things I did, the 15 different roles, the, the five successful projects, all the peak stories, all the highlight reel moments. I'm not going to do that because that is going to go way too long and I'm going to lose their attention if I do that. Okay. So as we move into chapters, each of your chapters should carry a similar pattern with these four elements. Now I want you to write these elements down. So if you have a piece of paper, write these down because they're important. Motivators. This is where you reveal what you were seeking to gain. Challenges, problems you faced, discoveries, and lessons you learned. Defining moments, reflections, events that sparked a turning point that changed you. And resolutions were the decisions that you made to support a move to the next chapter. Okay? So motivators, challenges, defining moments, and resolutions. And each chapter of your story should contain all four of these items. Okay? All four. And I'm going to break it down further. Okay? Because this is easy as one, two, three, four. Okay? When you have your idea for your career chapters formulated, Here's some examples of the language I might use to give you an idea of what the delivery side of this looks like. So I've given you the definitions of the four items that we use in each chapter. So these are the four buckets. Each chapter should have all four of these and information from all four. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to lend you some of my language, but feel free to use it as your own. I don't own it but it's some language that you can use. So here's some language that I might use to reveal motivators in my chapters. My greatest desire was to do something, right? I set out to do this thing. Um, I was initially drawn to this thing because of this. All right, so that's some language you can use to reveal motivators. Now, challenges reveal problems and lessons. So I might say, during this time, I've discovered something special. I've discovered that this thing happened, or despite what I thought, this is what I've learned. I might even tell my audience that, that even though things weren't easy, I enjoyed these things because I was doing what I was doing for a reason. So this is where you reveal a little bit of a, the, the deeper meaning. Okay. Now, defining moments showcase your resiliency and your self-awareness. And this is really important in an interview. So I might highlight a turning point here. Why did you go from chapter one to chapter two? So if you've got these chapters defined, let them know why, what were the defining moments that made you turn the page? Let them know how to feel at this moment of career. Even let them know what you experienced in a moment of truth. So each one of you on this call, I promise, has had many, many moments of truth. So I want to invite you to reveal those moments of truth. Now, the resolutions in your chapters are your decisions, those decisions that you made that bridged you to what's next. And sometimes these are in your control and sometimes they're not. And that's okay. So sometimes you were laid off and that's what forced you into the next um, chapter. But it's important to acknowledge that. And if you were affected by a reduction in force, you can tell that story and that's okay. You're not going to be judged. Um, you know, let them know how you forged your way forward after this adverse situation, if that has happened to you. Now, if you changed willingly, you should define your decision. Let them know reason. What is the reason behind that decision? Reveal the human side of how you make decisions. Now, if I were to draw up a trust circle right now, I might draw a circle and put trust in the center of it and put skills, behaviors, and approach outside that trust circle, because this is how people make decisions. They make decisions based on who they trust and what builds trust in an interview is you having the skills and competencies, which most of you will check off on, 
But then there's the behaviors. They want to know how you will behave at work. This is where your stories come into play and how you approach solving problems and making decisions. And again, this comes through and is reeled, revealed through storytelling. And so, um, you know, this is a frame that you can look at. I'm not going to repeat what's on the slide, but, you know, if you're in a position to take a screenshot or a snapshot of this, this would be a good, safe frame for you to use when thinking about developing chapter one. And again, chapter two and chapter three can follow a similar pattern, but you'll notice chapter three is going to be a little different. All right. And so um, would you like me to share like an example, a practical example of what maybe a chapter one sounds like? Yes. Yes. I'm getting some yeses. Okay, great. So you're with me. All right. So I might frame up chapter one, like something like this. In chapter one, I had this deep desire for success and was most interested in sales. And after 12 years in telecom at at and I learned that my love for sales was actually a love to help others. And seven roles later with at and I had moved from sales to operations to marketing and in a leadership role, eventually, uh, you know, responsible for people and the development of others. But I had learned in that to serve, um, but something still wasn't right. I wasn't serving myself. I remember waking up wondering if my destiny was to be the phone guy in my family. And the answer was no. So I decided to pack up my experience and create a change, which started chapter two in my career, which was a new beginning in the startup world. Okay. I'm going to just leave it right there. How are you feeling about that? Okay. Again, I'm giving you framing. This is framing for your use only. I want you to feel creative to come up with your stories. But what I'm telling you is most people that do storytelling without framing end up failing. And how do we know that? Because they end up going too long revealing too much information and people simply check out. So this is simply a way to help you frame this idea. And so now what you have to do is if you've been paying attention to this session, you can take that model and you can repeat it for each chapter. Now, again, you're going to use um, some artistic freedom in this process and you don't want to stay in this rigid framework, but I'm giving you the necessary ingredients to be successful in the framework. Now, at the end of your chapter three story, the most important um, thing to really think about is to give the power back to your interviewer. And so remember, you're opening up the interview typically with the tell me about yourself or a version of that. If you take 10 minutes of space, they are likely checked out. But what we're going to do is take about three, three and a half minutes of space, and we're not going to give them the details of everything that happened in our career. We're simply going to move through this simple framework that's going to get them, that's going to get them to a place that we need them at in the interview, which is curious. We need them curious. And so you have the ability to end chapter three with a bridge or an open door for them to walk through. And that bridge communicates who you want to help in the future, how, and it's an invitation for them to ask you questions about your resume and about you. And so again, you're not showing up telling them everything, overcoming every objection, okay? You really need to share with them who you want to help, how you would like to help them, and give them a bridge to ask you questions. And so again, this is another frame. This is another frame that you can use. Feel free to take a screenshot of this, and I'm going to give you a quick demo on it. Again, it sounds a little something like, you know, at the end of chapter three, I'm saying something like, as I, as I look to pursue what's next in my career, I'm looking for a position that allows me to help build and develop others. Um, I want to make a meaningful contribution to your company 
And I'm sure you've re reviewed my resume and you may have some curiosities about my roles and experiences. So I'm, I'm excited to start unpacking those for you. Where would you like me to start? How different does that sound? How different does that sound? So now we haven't given them like a debrief of our whole resume. We haven't given them all the information that they've looked at in the resume. We haven't regurgitated anything. We're simply now passing the torch over to them to say, hey, I understand that you've read my resume. And now you, now you understand some things about me that you didn't know before that's not on the resume. And so I'm ex excited to be here with you and to want, and I want to unpack those curiosities for you. So you're just asking them, where would you like me to start? And they're going to point you almost 100% of the time to the thing on your resume that they're most curious about. They're going to point you to the thing that they're most curious about, which is, by the way, where you want them to spend their time. Okay. I'm just going to look at the chat here for a second. Um, yes, without telling them everything, you'd leave the door open. It's important for you to open that door. Um, um, Deborah, if you leave them space for them to ask you something um, at the end of this, and it's not just an awkward silence, and they're, everybody's wondering where we're going next, you're just giving them the keys to the car back because they passed you the keys at the beginning. They said, hey, you take me where you want to take me. I'm all along for the ride. You're just giving it back to them and saying, where are you curious to go? Okay. So for introverts, it seems like it would be too long, but it helps get us out of our comfort zone. So Tara, what I would say is I agree with you. And I would say having frameworks can help guide you through this process of development in this area. Okay. Not trying to change who you are would never suggest that, but it would give you an opportunity, Tara, to kind of explore these frameworks. And I hope that helps you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Juanita, of course, going from this dreaded um, anxiety moment to just being excited about talking about yourself. Right. Um, Again, Donna, agree, you know, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Get it. Um, so, yes, um, I'm grateful that you are all here. Um, and so I would say, you know, as you think about this frame, feel free to make it your make it your own. Right. And one thing I'll say to you about storytelling that I know to be true is that Many of you have been told, you know, just show up and sell yourself. And it's easier said than done. And we know this as you've gone through this process of trying to find what's next. Um, nobody tells you how. Nobody tells you how. But what I will tell you is you're selling the story of you, not yourself. You're selling your experiences. And if you learn to communicate those experiences with power, you are going to find that you are performing at a level that's going to make your audience curious and you're going to stand out in the crowd, which is uh, stand out from the crowd, which is what you need in terms of how you perform in an interview. Okay. Um, and Angela, yeah. I mean, I, nobody tells you how to do this stuff. Everybody just tells you, Hey, go and sell yourself or go talk about yourself. But like, um, yeah, and, and I'm not like, I don't like to humble brag. I, I see comments um, like from Michelle, like nobody likes to humble brag. Um, yeah, we don't want to do that. This is like telling the story of how we make decisions, what was motivating us at the time, what made us make the moves that we move, that we, that we made in our career. And so that's why it's so um, important. So now on to the encore. Um, you've got this, but, but if you don't have this, I've got your back and because I've got a gift for you today and I promised a gift earlier, but before I, I open a package to this gift, I want to, I want you to, I want to tell you who this gift is for, right? Um, this is for people who feel like, um, you can hear me right now and you are doubtful. You are feeling doubtful about your future and your job search. Um, you're questioning everything your resume, your LinkedIn profile, your connections, 
You don't know what good enough looks like because it's been so long maybe since you've been open to work or in the market. And maybe you're failing in interviews because you haven't had one in years, right? And there may be a lot of you in this situation. I, I know that to be true because after you work somewhere for a long time and you've done internal interviews, they aren't the same as external interviews. We know that, right? This is for people who feel alone. Job search is one of the loneliest places, waking up every morning, applying, 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 waiting for callbacks, scrolling for opportunities, has you feeling isolated and desperate for help, right? But we don't think about how lonely job search is. And it's really, really difficult when you have to wake up and look at that screen every single morning and you're like, am I just going to sit here for another three hours and apply for jobs and just wait? That's not what I want from you. But there are also some of you that I feel like that are in this room that are on a mission and you're looking for a support system and you don't have time to waste because you need to get where you're going now because there's urgency in your life. And you're looking to stand out in a crowd and start the next chapter of your career. And the way I see it, you have two options. Option one or option A, however you look at it, is you keep going at it alone, looking for the right strategy and help, and eventually you will land what's next. And we all hope for that for you. We, we all help hope for that for each other. Option two is to, to decide and make a decision right now to find the right help that you need to pave your way to what's next. And I'm proud to announce that I have a way forward for you if you're interested, right? And I want to introduce you to the Career Copilot membership community. That is a community that I personally manage, um, that I help job seekers with things like storytelling, right? And our mission inside of our community is to guide you directly to the resources and the supportive people who understand your journey especially when you're transitioning to what's next. And the great news is you don't have to go about it alone. And so inside of the platform, um, here's what you get. You get my storytelling masterclasses, which again, I have storytelling masterclasses on tell me about you, on answering behavioral questions. I have uh, telling a peak story. I've got a plethora of these storytelling um, classes for you to, to digest. And we also do live sessions. I also invite coaches and career coaches in to give top tier advice priceless insights inside the community. And this community is real time. So you get 24 by seven support, meaning you can ask a question anytime. And our commitment is within 24 to 48 hours to get back to you when you have a question. We don't have all the answers and we rely on each other inside a community because we're in a community of people that are all striving towards the same goal, which is to get you where you are going. Okay. Now we also do on-demand learning. Now, one of the um, most valuable components of our platform are the weekly event spaces where I do live events. You'll get master classes with me, weekly office hours and launchpad sessions with, with, um, with my friends and career coaches. And so in our online platform, you're not alone. This is a place for you to celebrate your wins. We've got places for you to say hello, ask a question, hours of content and replay, right? And so this is what you should expect if you're interested in joining us and how it works. Now you might be thinking, well, this is the sales pitch. This is really not a sales pitch. I hope that you'll consider joining, but the truth is, is that I have about 144 people inside the community that I'm serving right now. Five of them were placed last week in roles and, and five of them announced that they got new jobs. And we don't see incredible, I don't have thousands of people inside the community. I'm just doing what I can as a coach to help people out. I do spend most of my time teaching um, professionals and executive storytelling. This is something that I just care about. So if you think about a cost investment of something like this, you're, you may pay 700 for your resume, 750 for a LinkedIn refresh, access to career coaches. You may spend thousands of dollars trying to get to what's next. and Or you may spend nothing at all, and that's fine. What I know is that many of you will make investments and are making investments in your career journey. And so our 40, 144 members with access to our platform are, are there to help you out today. And I just wanted to offer you a 10 day free pass if you want. Um, the cost of this is $90 per quarter or $30 a month. Okay. And we have an annual option there if you're interested. If this is not for you, that's okay. 
I just wanted to give you an opportunity to spend 10 days inside the platform. You have a QR code here. And I think um, Keith or one of the members of, or, or Katie will drop this link somewhere uh, inside of the platform. And it's okay. There's no pressure on my side to join, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about the about the pr platform of the process that we use. And so enough about that. Um, let's get on to um, Q&A. Keith, I, I know I love, by the way, to leave about 10 minutes for Q&A just so people can ask questions. So I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, Keith, that that you have here. And by the way, for the audience, thank you so much for being here for this. I hope this was useful. And if it was useful, please let us know because um, Flex Jobs and, and, and I care deeply about your satisfaction and your success. All right. Wonder that was wonderful information, Stan. We really appreciate you taking the time to share that with our attendees today. Uh, we do definitely have quite a few questions, so let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, a lot of the questions have been revolving around the length of your response to tell me about yourself. So could you provide a, a little bit of clarification there? I know you mentioned you, know, you don't need to include all the details about your career, but what, what's sort of the ideal length there in your mind? You know, I think three to four minutes is, is a good, if you're aiming for, if you have a goal, I would be shooting for three to four minutes. It's really difficult to do the longer, um, Keith, the longer the career journey, mm -hmm. especially if you're prepping the old way of trying to articulate where you've been mm -hmm. and, and what you've done in those roles. And that's why it doesn't work. It be like me, if I have more than four jobs and I've got to tell you what I did there, what my responsible bit, responsibilities were there, what my wins were, what my obstacles were there, I'm, I'm in, in minute four after I've just talked about one experience. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I hope that, I hope that helps whoever asked that question. Yep. Another one uh, that I saw repeated uh, quite a few times, people are asking, you know, do you need to call them chapters exactly as you're telling the story? Could you refer to them as, as eras or, or periods or maybe something else? I love this question, Keith, because I get this question a lot. People feel maybe uncomfortable using the word chapters. And I don't know why that is, but what I will say is that everyone you meet understands what a chapter is. And so when you use the term chapter, what happens in their brain is they say, oh, this is a three chapter story. Now, if I'm telling you it's three chapters and I'm on chapter one and 45 seconds goes by and I'm already on chapter two, that's sending another signal to my brain saying this is moving quickly. So I need to pay attention. So I like to use chapters personally because it actually gives people an idea that there is an end to this story. So pay attention because I'm moving from one to two to three. Very good. And that helps you with uh, determining sort of the timing of your response like you were talking about. That's absolutely cool. right. And again, um, you, you can use, you don't have to use chapters. I prefer to use chapters. Sure. Wonderful. Um, let's see. So now uh, that was sort of a summation of a, a lot of the questions I saw coming through. But now let's turn to our most upvoted questions. First one here says, how long after an interview before you should consider yourself ghosted, uh, especially if the interviewers were, you know, expressing that they were really interested in you during the interview? What are your thoughts on that? Well, you, I, at the end of the interview, I think like, you shouldn't get super pumped and lose track of the goal when they say they're excited or you feel like they're excited. You should stick to the program of what should I expect in terms of follow-up? What are the next steps? And is it possible for us to get on the calendar for a next step? Hmm. And some people don't ask this question because we get so hyped up and so caught up in the moment that we feel like things went well and then we get disappointed when we don't hear back. Sure. But I'm always teaching people to try to get to that logical next step mm -hmm. um, and asking those questions at the end of the interview. Like you can get caught, you can get caught up, Keith, in the hype. And I know you know this of it. This just felt good. It felt great. And, and then you kind of lose track of your discipline around, oh, I've got to get a next step on the schedule for this. I've got to ask them when we're moving forward, if we're moving forward. And what does that look like? That's a really good point. Thank you for sharing that. 
Um, let's see. So we have another good question. I know that this can be a challenging one for a lot of people. How do you answer the question, you know, why did you leave your last job when it was a toxic environment, but you don't want to, you know, speak negatively about your past employer? Yeah, look, th this is tr uh, always tricky because the main reason that this is tricky is because you have emotions that are tied to this employer. And when we're in toxic environments, whether they're in personal or work relationships or with an employer, we have an emotional, uh, something is happening with us emotionally. So it's hard for us to, uh, you know, guard against that. It's hard for us to not share it. And we feel um, like we're at risk in sharing too much. And what I would say is um, when you have a, an environment, a toxic environment, something that didn't work out in your last employer, obviously don't disparage that employer, but try to explain why you made the decisions you made, okay? Because it, if it wasn't the right fit for you, um, maybe that, that part of that um, toxicity, for lack of a better word, has to do with them not giving you opportunities to share your ideas. Hmm. I mean, and again, there's no, you know, I have to get into the detail of the situation to really answer that question effectively. Sure. What I would say, you know, make sure you're not projecting in a negative light what that that experience has been with that employer. And maybe it sounds like, hey, I, I like to use the word key. This is like a secret, I feel, like one of my secrets. I use the word alignment. Like I say things like, you know, at the last role I was at, I felt like there was a real misalignment in what my values were, what I believe was important to me and the organization, and what the leadership team felt was important. And for that reason alone, it was enough to cause me to look elsewhere. Hmm. That's really so, good. Again, yeah. just again, loaning you some language. No, that's really good. It's a good example of how to handle a tricky situation with tact. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Um, we have a couple other questions that I would like to touch on here. So this person is asking about the uh, the elephant in the room because they are quite a bit older um, that, uh, mm -hmm. than the last time that they were looking for work. They're saying that they're, they're in their 50s and they're worried that it may work against them. So mm -hmm. do you have any pointers about um, you know issues related to ageism? We also had, sorry to add on to that, uh, quite a few questions about, you know, well, what if the chapters of my story extend beyond that kind of general 10 to 15 years? that is usually recommended in terms of talking about your professional experience? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I'm 52, uh, full disclosure here on this call. And so I, I, do, I do speak from a per perspective of someone who's over 50. And when I look at my career chapters, I break it into three. Um, when you have longer experiences, you have to bucket them bigger. You have to think bigger in, in terms of your experiences. You don't want to think about, you know, you, you start to bucket five or six experiences. Is there a theme inside of that that you can talk about? Right. But we also are struggling with ageism. Um, what I would like to say uh, to, you know, to people who are, you know, in their fifties, maybe they're struggling and they're feeling like, you know, ageism is really preventing me from getting to the next level. When you show up and you can articulate your journey and the value that you can provide to an organization, I know age is a thing and I acknowledge that, but I feel like, I feel like there are ways to overcome it, Keith. Um, and I feel like the, the stronger you are at communicating the story of your lived experiences and how that solves the problems and helps your employers reach their desired state, regardless of age, I think there are ways to overcome that. And it doesn't work in all scenarios because we still feel like people are picking people. I mean, we know that people have biases. And so that exists, but I just choose to, um, the best way that I help people in that, in that realm, Keith, is to prepare them and to have them be prepared in the right ways. 
Very well said. Thank you for sharing that. And then if we could squeeze in uh, just one more question here. Sure. Um, so someone is asking about similarly to uh, trying to not speak negatively about a past employer, you know, how do you avoid not speaking negatively about yourself when they're asking about, you know, your weaknesses or, or your less than stellar qualities or mistakes that you've made? How do you approach that situation? Yeah. So this is a perfect example of, you know, a lot of times you think that you're supposed to just share one word, like what is your weakness? And you go, Oh, uh, this thing, or sometimes Keith, you take your weakness and you clothe it in a strength. Mm -hmm. So it's like, Oh, well I am, you know, I'm just over dedicated or I work too much or like I have no, you know, I need to work on better work-life balance. I've heard that a million times. And a lot of times it sounds like bull crap and it, and it kind of is bull crap. Right. But I would say the way I like to overcome it is I like to share a story where something went wrong and it revealed a weakness that you um, recognize, that you own. And then you also realize that you have to be conscious of this area that you have been conscious of, essentially, for lack of a better term, for the for the most part of your career. Hey, look, something that. um you have failed at reveals a weakness and you could say you could certainly share a story that reveals a weakness that came to your attention that is something that you're aware of and that you're always fighting against again think of a weakness if you're on this call as a battle that you are fighting all the time it's like your natural self versus who you need to be at work and that weakness is something that you're always wanting to overcome but you've never said, you haven't said that you've beat it. You're just acknowledging that it's something that I'm fighting against all day and I've got to do my best to overcome it. I think that would show that, you know, you're, you're holding yourself accountable, which is. Yeah. Important. Yeah. Because nobody's going to believe you when you say your weakness is, is, um, working too hard. Yep. You know? No, Absolutely. Well, I think that that is a good point to uh, end our session on Stan. Um, so a big thank you to you for, for joining us today and providing so many great insights. There was a lot of positive feedback in the chat already. Um, yeah. Thank you to everyone who attended today. Uh, as a reminder, later this week, you will receive an email with a copy of the recording. Uh, so on behalf of Flex Jobs and our career experts team, uh, I want to thank you all again and wish you all the best of luck in your job search. Take I care. love it. Thank you all. Appreciate you all. Hope to see you on LinkedIn. Take Thanks. care. Thanks again, Stan. All right.